Hi, I'm Matt. Welcome to Soil Lab. Today we've got another fun study to look at. We're going to be looking at or going through the results of different sample preparations and how those sample preparations affect bioavailable nutrients. So what are the different preparations? We're going to be looking at dried and ground soil versus using field moist soil. Now the dried and ground soil, that's going to be our standard preparation method for conventional soil analysis. And our field moist soil is going to be the standard sample preparation for our ion exchange resin capsules. If you haven't seen the science behind soil testing for DIY, be sure to click here and check that out to understand more about the process for each of those soil testing methods. One of the main questions we got from the science behind soil testing video is why the ion exchange resin capsules and the conventional soil analysis use different preparation methods. So in other words, why don't we dry and grind soil for ion exchange resin soil testing and why doesn't the conventional soil analysis use field moist soil? Well, it really comes down to what's being measured and how it's being measured. Um, both are very repeatable methods. Um, however, when it's dried and ground and put through that conventional soil analysis, you'll remember that several subsamples were taken to run a myriad of different tests. Whereas there's really just one extraction when the ion exchange resin capsules are being used. And so a field moist soil better represents bioavailable nutrients in a moist soil in the field. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand why I tend to use the data from ion exchange resin capsules and field moist soil to drive fertility decisions in season in my lawn and garden. So within a lab, I think it's really important that we all know that the same method of sample preparation is used consistently. So why is it field moist that's used in the ion exchange resin capsules? Well, over the years, it's been demonstrated that drying and grinding the, the soil sample prior to running the analysis might change the physical and chemical characteristics of that soil and therefore change the measurement of that true bioavailable nutrient. If we're thinking about how plant roots take up nutrients, they take up nutrients from that area immediately adjacent to the root. And that area is known as the rhizosphere. In that rhizosphere, water is constantly moving into the rhizosphere and then from the rhizosphere into that plant root. Well, as that water is moving into the rhizosphere and into the root, nutrients are moving into that plant root via a process called mass flow. I find that our ion exchange resin capsules, when they're saturated, very closely mimic that rhizosphere and the capsules and the beads themselves very closely mimic that plant root. Now, can drying and grinding change those physical and chemical characteristics? That's what we're going to explore. So this whole idea of comparing and contrasting dried and ground versus field moist soil is not a, new, uh, not a new concept whatsoever. We certainly don't take ownership of coming up with this idea here at Soil Lab. This actually has been going on since the 1960s and 70s and really carried over into the 80s and we just thought it'd be fun to re-explore it. So excuse me while I read a direct quote from Dr. Antonio Malarino at Iowa State University. He says, quote, Iowa State research in the 1960s and 70s had shown that testing non-dried or field moist soil samples provided a better estimate of potassium fertilizer needs than testing dried samples, but both procedures provided similar estimates for phosphorus. This method was adopted by the Iowa State University Soil Testing Lab for phosphorus and potassium and was used throughout much of the 1970s and 1980s. But they decided to discontinue this method because it didn't align with what other soil testing labs across the country were doing. So they did discontinue the use of this method and go back to the dried and ground method so that it was more standardized across the conventional soil testing laboratories. Further research shows that drying and grinding of samples not only affects potassium, but other nutrients as well. Some that I think are notable would be nitrogen, especially in the ammonium form, and although it's not always easy to explain, sulfur or sulfate as well. The drying and grinding, although making sample handling more easy, doesn't always mean it's a better estimation tool for nutrients. What we're going to do today is take four soils and compare the field moist versus the dried and ground uh, bioavailable nutrient results. So what do we do? How do we design this study? Well, we chose four different unique soils. We had a couple of different silt loam soils. We also had a clay loam and a sandy loam. So four different soils texturally. Now, 
you might think, Matt, you just said two silt loam soils. Well, if we take a look at the soil textural triangle, we did have two silt loam soils, and textually they're the same. But one of them had uh, significantly more clay than the other. So you can see they're textually the same, but one was probably closer to about 20% clay, and the other was a bit lower at around 5% clay. Now, we also had that sandy loam soil, and it landed right about there on this soil textural triangle. And you can see that that had significantly more sand um, while still having some clay, but, but very little silt. And then lastly, we had one that was texturally a clay or a clay loam um, that would have landed right in this region here. Um, so a very fine textured soil, a coarse textured soil, and a couple in the middle. So for each of those soils, we took five samples, field moist, and added them directly to the ion exchange resin capsules. For the dried and ground, we again took those five subsamples, but we used a mortar and pestle to grind those up um, after they'd been oven dried. Now, is that exactly how it's in? Is gonna happen in a lot of our commercial, conventional testing labs? Not necessarily. Um, they may use mechanical grinders as opposed to the, the physical grinder that I use, but the end result is the same. That soil's been dried and ground before being added in to the ion exchange resin capsule. From here, we shipped those samples off to the lab, let those soak, and got our results. Again, we ran five replications for each of these um, for both the field moist and for the dried in ground. So what did we learn? Well, the very first element or nutrient that we spoke about was potassium. So let's just take a little bit of a deeper dive into potassium in particular. So the chart we're looking at here compares the dried and ground soil against the field moist soil. And what did we learn? Well, the, the units we're looking at today are just percent change. Now, the values that come out of the soil test are parts per million. So we compared parts per million against parts per million and came up with the percent change. And what we learned was in both of our silt loam soils, we saw, oh, about 5% to 7% more potassium measured when we dried and ground that soil. So in theory, that might be overestimating the bioavailable potassium in those soils. But 5 to 7% isn't a huge amount. As we moved into these other soils that had a different soil mineralogy, we see that that sandy loam had, oh, about a 13% increase, and the clay had over a 35% increase uh, in the bioavailable potassium. Now, if we understood clay minerals, you know that those are layered. So sometimes they're one to one, sometimes they're two to one. And as we grind that up, we can actually extract some potassium from those inner layers of the clay particles. And that's what I think happened here, leading to that overestimation of bioavailable potassium. Now I say overestimation only because that's extracting a nutrient that wouldn't normally be bioavailable in that field moist state. Now, was this unique just to potassium? It wasn't. As I mentioned before, other elements can see differences too, in particular nitrogen and sulfur. So let's go ahead and take a look at just some other elements. So some other elements that we look at. With the nitrate, we saw some differences, but they weren't huge. Again, this is percent change between dried and ground and field moist. So our nitrogen was about plus or minus 5% as nitrate. Our nitrogen as ammonium, however, we again see an increase up to, oh, you know, well over 50% increase in bioavailable ammonium just when drying and grinding. So there are some significant differences there. We did see significant differences in iron as well. Some of those approaching nearly 180% more extracted bioavailable iron when dried and ground as opposed to what your plant root is actually seeing in that rhizosphere in that field moist state. Similar trends can be seen for both manganese as well as sulfur um, where we saw smaller differences for phosphorus and again that significant dif difference in potassium that we just zoomed in on.
So what's all this even mean? Well, it just means if you get two different soil tests, two different soil test types, you might end up with different fertilizer recommendations. And oftentimes that's because nutrient estimation or nutrient measurement uh, might vary based on that sample preparation. So we certainly learned that drying and grinding can change the bioavailability of a nutrient, especially when it's measured using the ion exchange resin capsules. The ion exchange resin capsules very well measure what your plant actually sees. Now, sure, the best and truest measurement of nutritional status of your plant is gonna be a tissue test, but that tissue test is gonna be reactive, right? So you've already seen the nutrient deficiency before you've had the ability to correct it. I'd argue that using an ion exchange resin capsule allows you to start to see or track that deficiency before the plant has a physiological decline. Within the bounds of this study, drying and grinding changed the nutrient status of almost every nutrient, although to varying levels. So you might recall that the amount of uh, nitrate wasn't changed that significantly, where others such as iron and sulfur were changed pretty significantly. These changes are likely occurring because of different soil mineralogy, right? I mentioned those layered clays. Um, clearly, when we have more sand, we have less clay oftentimes, um, and so we might not see those differences as extreme in some soils compared to others. The results that we had here really aligned well with results from prior studies, such as that Iowa State study that we saw earlier. Being a little bit of a data geek, as I dove into the data, one of the things that I realized um, as I parsed through that, that information, 70% of the dried versus the field moist soils had more than a 15% difference in nutrient availability. So if we really wanna see what's bioavailable to our nutrients at that point in the growing season, the ion exchange resin capsules are probably gonna be our best in-season indicator of that, as opposed to estimations of nutrient release um, following drying and grinding and traditional or conventional soil analysis. Now, do I ever use a conventional soil analysis? I do, and that's usually for tracking long-term trends over time. And what is that time frame I'm referencing here? Years, maybe every three, five years. So certainly each tool has its spot. So for the in-season data that drives decisions in my lawn and garden, I use the ion exchange resin capsules and a field moist soil so that I'm getting a true sense of what that plant root is actually seeing in the soil environment. Hopefully you found this useful. You can put this data to use in your lawn and garden. If so, please like, subscribe, and comment what you'd like to see next. I'll see you in the lab.